feature film in two days. So I had this kind of moment of epiphany about doing this film. And I called Mike Costello, my director of photography, and said, Can we do it? Am I mad? Is it possible? Yes, you are mad. But yeah, I think this is possible. So I kind of put the phone down and thought, oh, I was expecting him to talk me out of it, basically. So I, then I called um, Mercedes and Ben. Phil rings and says, now you're going to think I'm completely mad and tell me I'm stupid, tell me to go away, tell me to never ring you at this time of night again, but I've got an idea. How about doing this feature film uh, about a guy himself and self online, it's a comedy drama, and we're going to shoot in two days. At this point, I just looked at Ben and went, he wants us to shoot a film in two days. If we're going to do this, I needed a tight team. You know, I, I had, you know, we, uh, we've got the family of heads of departments and crew and people that I love to work with. But in terms of producing, I could not do this by myself. I couldn't, I could not produce this film by myself. So I'm like, Phil, how are you going to pay for this film? Quite graciously, uh, everyone decided to put in the same amount of money to make this film. So we very quickly decided that obviously it made sense for Mike to cover all things technical. Phil, obviously, the writing, the directing. Ben and I decided that Ben would concentrate on the casting of it, and I would therefore concentrate on all the other bits. So that's sort of all the logistics, pulling everybody together, making sure everybody was fed and watered, they could get to where they needed to be. All of those intricate little details that nobody else would have had time to sort out. So it was very clear early on that we trusted each other implicitly, and we each went off did our own thing, and then reported back each evening as to where we were at. And that's it, that's the four producers we came to together as a team. Hello. Your name is? Roy Walker. And what do you do for a living? I'm a stand-up comic. I, I, I play a, a, a psychologist who, uh, who tries to analyse the reasons for these things. You know, I got the script last night and uh, I deleted it, deluded it, deluded it, diluted it. What do you do when you press the wrong button on the computer? Here you are, Master Brew. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I tried that once myself. And now, first song. So, we've worked on a number of projects in the past, and initially they were short films that I wrote, and then he got me to act in them. Uh, and he went away one time and wrote a short film. It was kind of the easiest thing I'd written. It was uh, right around the time where there was that girl who was selling a virginity on eBay, and. There was lots of crazy stories going on about people trying to sell things on eBay. And the short film was the basis for this. And I actually asked Phil that at some stage I would like to rewrite it. I would like to be the person that actually took this into a feature length film. You know, we got talking about it and we continued to talk about it for years, you know, that we really should do something with that idea. You know, we, what should we do? And it just sat there and it kept, it kept coming back to us. And eventually, I, I mean, I had all sorts of ideas of writing it for an American audience and it lasting that it's a two week auction and this guy was going to get steadily more famous over the two weeks and he was going to fly down the Grand Canyon and meet loads of beautiful women. He wasn't married in the, in the initial um, version. And then Phil said, look, someone's going to make this film, whether it's me or someone else, someone's going to make a film like this. Because Aileen and I have talked about it a lot. Uh, previously, we knew it was going to be one location. It's going to be inside a house, outside a house. I thought, great, shoot inside first, outside after. That's two days. Yeah, you rang me and said, we're having a meeting on Wednesday about writing a script. And, I, and I'm going to shoot it in two days. And I said, OK. And I went away and started writing the story. And I'd finished writing the story by the time we'd had the second meeting, which was on the Thursday with Ben and Merck. Which is, was a week? Uh, no, it was less than a week. It was four days. And, uh, and that, that story was a the, long... The, the story of the script. It was the, it was the entire story of the script was written. Yeah. And then at that meeting, Ben turned around to me and said, yeah, we've met with, uh, with people in London and they'd like to see the script by um, next Wednesday, all right, for you? Hello, my name is John Thompson. I am an actor, sometimes comedian, writer, professional drummer. You name it, I'll have a go at it. They said, would you do a cameo as yourself playing a neighbour who uh, lives next door to Mr Foster, who is up for sale on, a, on an auction site on the internet? Read it, thought it was funny. Um, and uh, that's why I'm here. Once we decided we we're going to do this in two days, obviously we had to think about how, how the hell we could do it. Detail was key, you know, uh, having 
as much as this planned as we possibly could. And to contradict that, also allow things to happen that we didn't plan for in terms of improvisation, in terms of that sort of thing of, of performance. But in terms of, uh, Mike and I had this phone call. As that phone call went on for about 45 mi minutes, maybe an hour, where we just discussed, we just thrashed out the, the, the principles of how you would do that. What are the things that <laughs> waste time on sets? And that's really bad to say because then it's not wasting time. That is the art of film. Firstly, the script obviously had to be written so you could shoot it in two days. Inside the house one day, outside the house the next day. And that brings with it, it's a solution, but it brings with it problems. So we just tried to come up with rules about what, what it is that slows things down. And obviously one of those is lighting. Traditionally, we'd light from one area, you'd turn around, you'd light from another area, you'd do a close-up, you'd bring your lights in, you'd tweak, possibly. That's not how we did it. That's something that eats time. So the solution to that is pre-light the house. You know, pre-light the house so the actors can move wherever they want to. I'd hatch this cunning plot. Big Victorian house. We're in Didsbury, uh, second location. This is the house. So I'm just gonna go in and have a look and see, see what it's like. And we were going to windbag the ceiling and light above the windbag and do that in every room that we were gonna use. So we had a certain amount of ambient light within the room. So then you could look out the windows, you could do anything you wanted. Basically, you had 360. And this is ideal. Yeah, it's not, artistically, it's not fantastic, but it's ideal in terms of trying to get maximum coverage. It takes ages to light something beautifully if you want it to look beautiful, you know? You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't make something look beautiful like that. You know, it doesn't happen. So that was kind of rule number one, really. It was to say, this film isn't about look. There are a few other obvious problems that we had. I, I think the film finished off about 76 minutes, uh, 77 minutes, round, round about that. So, you know, even if you, if you slice that in half, um, take a bit off for the interior day because it's harder to shoot interiors than it is exteriors and you say to yourself that we had to get pretty much 30 minutes of footage at the end of our first day of shooting. I mean that's like crossroad stuff. That's like, you know, if, you're, if you haven't done a scene by 10 past 8 in the morning, you're behind. You know, you've lost it. I remember actually where I was at the time on the phone when I said to Phil, the difficulty isn't mine because I can only do a certain amount. We can pre-light it. Hopefully we can keep the lights out of shot. We can make it look okay. You know, you'll never make it look brilliant. Forget about it. It can never be, be brilliant if you're going to shoot in that sort of way. We can get our operators to capture what happens in a real way as if this is unfolding before you. That can be part of the style. But the performances have to be there. We don't have time to labour a performance. We don't have time to say, look, we've got to go again, we've got to go again. The close-up didn't quite work. You're not even going to know that. You're rattling through this so fast. Best we can do, if we capture the performance of your actors, then we can do this. All over to you, Phil. <laughs> no pressure, but get good actors. I've got a university scholarship to go there. We just did action, by the way. Thanks. You call me. They just said action. <laughs> said action. <laughs> this, Laura. I, I mean, yeah, she, she'll, she'll thank me when it's over. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> We'd initially been told that because of the, the budget we were on and the timescales we were, we were working to, there was no way we'd get anybody well known at all. We should be looking at um, unheard of actors with little or no experience, perhaps straight out of drama school. And of course, that was kind of red rag to a ball because there was no way I was going to take people's advice on that. I just read it recently, someone said, the film features uh, Phil Hawkins's repertory of actors. And, which was quite nice actually, I never really thought about it like that. But yes, I do like to use the same actors um, in, in, uh, in different roles. I find it really interesting. So, you know, we had 
roles written for uh, Jess Blake, Dan Morgan, you know, Chris Hannon, Sarah, um, and uh, Alvin, and uh, Kai Manford. Is this because of that top bunk? Doing the top bunks. Um, and uh, so I thought, oh great, well that's most of the cast sorted. All we need now are the faces, you know? And we will sell this film on getting a really known John. We just kind of launched into it really. Usually you'd have a massive team of people doing this. If you look at the credits of most major feature films, the casting department on its own is about 20 people. Um, and there was me and a phone. I thought to attract cameos, to attract faces into this film, I can't pick up the phone and say, can I have an actor for no money for a week, please? You know, or five weeks, you know? I, it, it wasn't gonna happen. Um, one of the first calls I made was to Lee Boardman's agent, Roger Charteris. Um, and he was just supremely kind and helpful and generous with his time in terms of looking at others of his artists who might be interested. He knew that Lee would go straight away for the role um, of Chris. Um, but he also then uh, spoke to his colleague, Jilly, uh, also works at Camera Credit, uh, who talked to us about Eva Pope. They said, oh, can we get a script to her, like a hard copy of the script? And uh, Ben and I thought, you know what? Let's not send the courier or runner. We'll go ourselves. So... Epic road trip. Yeah, we, so we drove to Eva's house and... And uh, Eva was out. Yeah, <laughs> which is totally uh, brilliant. We, we were going to go up there, do the sell, you know, hi, this mm. is what we're doing, you know, please mm. be a part of the film. And, and, um, and of course she was out. Um, but her mum was in, and so we met Pauline, and um, she brought us in. We met the dog. We met the dog. Who left the script. Left the script, had a little chat. Mm. You spoke to Eva on the phone. Yeah. And she read the script, loved it, um, which is great because, you know, Laura's one of those roles where you really need to read it and look through what's on the page in order to um, uh, really make that role your own. And then we had, you know, cameos flying around, but then casting became really, really a massive stress. We've had certain people let us down, certain agents, but I mean, the um, thing is, most people have been great. And, and the people we've got so far are fantastic and they're brilliant. We just still need to cast our lead. But this close, this close. <laughs> but John Foster, you know, who the hell was going to play John Foster? It's <laughs> quarter to 11 on October, August the 27th. Um, here we are at the production office. And um, we've just had a bit of news. Philip, perhaps you would care to explain. I'm not going to do it twice, because it's fake the second time. I mean, we just cheered for something, and Ben's now going to... Should we do it again? Whee! So, he sent me a list of his dates and times and things that is available. Obviously, he's doing the one show, he's doing his first... Uh, if so, he's only uh, doing one show, then that'll make it a lot easier. He it's, told you this... Because we'll be able to work around one show. It's like that's... a joke, only not funny. <laughs> it's a good job Mike didn't write the script. <laughs> Cut to me being excited to this. Um, the actor that I really wanted and who we were trying everything to get you know, on schedule, um, and make schedule work, and, that, and basically it was up till 5 a.m. redoing the whole shooting schedule to make it work around for this particular guy who I thought would be brilliant. He was totally wanting to do it and um, you keep Michael baying me with all this tracking around. Um, can't do it, he needs to spend time with the family because he's a busy guy at the moment and I totally understand that so I'm not, I'm not annoyed, I'm not anything to him, you know, but it's just like it's Friday, we shoot a week today, oh god we shoot a week today. You know, we didn't have any money to say, you know, we've got some money, read our script, or we're going to go somewhere else, we kind of had to like tipped her around it and go, please, is, have they read it yet? This was the weekend before the shoot, you know, and um, it was, it was staring me in the face all along, to be honest. It really, really was. And I didn't see it because I was lost in trying to find a famous person, you know, a known actor to play this role. And Chris Dane 
popped into my head. I didn't realise that the perfect guy for this role was someone I'd already worked with. And I worked with Chris on The Butterfly too. But how do you call an actor on a Sunday night, get them to get on a train the next day, and then they're shooting on Friday, and leading a feature film? And quite a wordy part as well. Chris Dane, uh, who, who plays the main part, uh, he wasn't confirmed on the job until about a week before we started shooting as well. And he stepped in and then won Best Actor at the London Independent Film Festival. He did it. And he, he turned up, he'd read it, he already knew it, you know, he started learning it. And uh, the first time he walked into, into rehearsals, it was just like, oh my God, the, the, I can't imagine anyone else doing it now. It's not every day that women, <laughs> women do this to me. For, for me, as an actor, it's been cool because normally on films, especially, you get to do very little. So you, you kind of, people set up forever and light and sound and camera and that's all very, very important. And then the actors are put in, you do rehearsal and stuff like that. And then you do two minutes of going, well, yeah. And then that scene is wrapped and then you sit for two hours waiting for the next, you know, lighting stage or whatever. Whereas this is just, I mean, I've been on my feet apart from lunch, um, probably from sort of seven o'clock. We've been working constantly, so just going from one scene into the next. You can't keep in the energy of the piece because you're constantly thrown into the next scene. So, um, yeah, so it's been really good, but I have no idea what, what it looks like. <laughs> there's, been some, there's been some good stuff. Yeah, Lee, Lee is amazing. He's, he's, he's so good to work with because there's just so much coming. Oh, you, know, you can just use whatever he is doing with that is brilliant. The challenges were to find a house that, that would allow us in for a week for nothing <laughs> with no front garden wall, no trees, so you had a clear view from the house out to the road so that the melee that goes with the whole program, i.e. the uh, outside broadcast units, the burger van, the, the, the press pack that are chasing the fella uh, can be seen clearly from the house. So just trying to find a house with all those elements that are prepared to allow us to move Chipperfield Circus indoors into their house for a week, that's a challenge. We had one location booked, all ready to go. We had a final meeting to sort out the contract to, to say that we could shoot and rehearse at this location and uh, less than a week before we started shooting, the location pulled out on us. Of course, the, the location changed. Oh my gosh, it was, just, it was one of those phone calls. I'd phoned up on the Monday morning saying, morning, we'll be there at 12, as planned, to get the response back. Uh, no, I really don't think you should come at 12. And my heart absolutely sank. The phone went down, we put the kettle on, had a cup of tea, tea, souls, everything in our house. Had a cup of tea, sat there and just thought, well, there's nothing left for it, let's get in the car. At which point, Ben's looking at me thinking I'm mad. And I was like, right, will you ring Phil? We're getting in the car. Picked up Phil um, and I'm, I'm driving. Mercedes is explaining to him that the perfect location that we spent ages wrecking and getting used to is now gone. Um, and we drove around a few uh, other potential places, none of which were right, uh, until we stumbled on a street that we were driving around thinking this, these all look brilliant from the outside. Logistically, we could get trucks parked up here. Um, but of course it was the middle of the day, so everybody was out. Um, and then Mercedes just yelled, stop. So I slammed the brakes on the car. She leaps out of the car, putting lipstick on as she goes. And she spotted one of the houses was being renovated and there was a, a builder outside. And it, she dragged Phil out of the car and they went and had a look inside. Obviously it wasn't gonna be that house we were filming in because it was still being built, but um, it gave us an idea of the size and what the inside, inside was like. Phil straight away realised that the, the interior was just as great as the exterior. So at that point we realised that was the road we needed to concentrate on. So we nipped home, typed up some letters and literally put letters into every single door in that street, of which there must have been, what, 50? Mm -hmm. And we just had to sit and wait for the phone to ring. There was nobody in, everybody works, nine to five, so we had to wait until the evening. But luckily we had three phone calls. By seven o'clock. And so the next morning we went to see three different houses 
and we got number 10 and it was absolutely perfect both inside and out and Terry and Jeff were just brilliant they let us just walk in take over they never questioned anything they even made tea and helped us clean up at the end mm. of the day they were just brilliant and we're still talking to them now of course the location changed which brought in a few problems uh, low ceilings Phil had ideas that he wanted to do a steady cam shot through three or four rooms. And the only place we could light from was outside. No choice. It made sense as well. It makes sense because you have a prep day, you put all your lights on the outside of the house, you decide where your angles are and where you're least likely to create problems in terms of either reflections of lamps or seeing lamps directly in shot. And I think in the finished film, I saw two lamps. I think two lamps, and pretty obviously there. Maybe three. <laughs> but come on, you know, what can you do? Uh, I tried to push the operators back, but they wouldn't go. And the characters keep moving, and before you know it, they don't, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be little automatons that wander in and hit marks, and they start acting and getting into it and move, so. It's their fault, ultimately. Luckily we found this amazing house, which is much better than the old one, which is great. Um, and basically, um, what you've seen is basically Ben and Merck just totally on the phone all the time. If there's ever the time to do an experiment about cancer in your head for mobile phones, these are your subjects. Thanks um, for your face being on the laptop as well. What you've got here, on the one side, you've got Mercedes getting crew. On the other side, you've got Ben getting cast. And I'm sitting here, you know, in the sun, gathering my thoughts, really, just being creative. Now the weather, here's Justin Mohas. Thanks, God. What does the weather say? Right, warm, sunny day. Well, it better be. <laughs> could always grade it out. You know, you've got, you can go back to the raw footage, 4K footage, and you can grade it out and bring it up and make it a bit colder, make it a bit warmer. But if you start where you want to be, it sort of makes sense. The really interesting thing, though, is that we had to deal with where the sun was going to be at certain times of day, the fact that this was always going to change. On a traditional commercial, you'd try and deal with that in terms of your schedule and be able to say, right, you know, if we can start here and our second shot will be there, and then that shot that's supposed to be earlier in the day, can we, you know, but actually appears later in your your cut scene, you can put it in there, you can schedule it like that, but this is just impossible, you know, we looked at it, we thought about it, and we thought, well, it's supposed to be a 90 minute period, it shouldn't change that much, maybe have the, you know, sun going behind the clouds and it'll come in and out a bit and you can sort of accept a little bit of that, but, you know, we started off practically first thing in the morning and we finished practically, you know, as it went dark. Yeah, I think we were still shooting inside the house and doing little pickups that we knew we could light um, night for day. And there isn't a huge amount you can do in terms of scheduling to deal with a circumstance like that. You just have to hope. Now, we lit the interior as if it was going to be sort of sunny-ish, slightly directional, which we figured, judging by the weather report, would happen. And the second day it did happen, so we got lucky. My name's Jessica Blake, and I play Maya Long in Being Sold. She's an interesting character. On the surface, she's not very likeable. She's manipulative. She's ruthless. But I guess she has her reasons. The story of John Foster is her first big break, her first big opportunity to get her career off the ground. And she's also working in a very male orientated world full of chauvinistic idiots like Dan Turner. So she's having to kind of fight that as well. And she's not afraid to use her assets, should we say. I'm uh, Chris Hannon. I'm an actor and I'm playing uh, Luke Mather in the film. And Luke is a news producer and he produces Dan Turner. Dan Turner, everyone! who's the kind of big famous news anchor who shows up on the scene and tries to get the scoop and has been slightly beaten to it by his ex-girlfriend Maya. Two, three, 
Dantana time. And we've been encouraged to ad lib, which is good. I like doing that. And you, you know, it's really hard to stick to the script to make sure each line gets captured on camera. So there'll be a lot of elaborating around the script, adding bits on. Uh, today's last day of rehearsal, and we start shooting tomorrow. And tomorrow's the interiors. And then Saturday is gonna all be shot out here. The neighbours must be going mental. The whole street's gonna be shut down for two days. I won't be happy about it. And you can't swear. We've got two S words and one B word, and that's all we're allowed. Frickin' or freaking, wazzock, pillock, I might throw in on the day. It's like CBBC swearing. When you're funding a film, there are certain criteria that mark it out as a high budget, low budget feature, usually for tax reasons and things like that. The, um, the benchmark is uh, a low budget film is under two million uh, production budget. Uh, a very low budget film is under one million and we were so far off the bottom of the scale, um, we didn't even qualify as no budget. We shot the entire film for um, £20,000, and all of that money came from our own pockets, well, initially, um, and uh, helping kind with people who gave us uh, gear for, for free, uh, and that kind of thing. But even then, that wasn't uh, enough, and at the, the, at the last minute, the reason we got up to twenty thousand um, pounds was that Jason uh, at the last minute came in and said he wanted to invest in the, in the film and help. Well I wouldn't quite go that far. We, we were sat at Sunday lunch and I sat there and jokingly said to my brother you don't want to invest in a feature film do you? At which point Jason turns around to me and says yeah why do you know anyone making one? Well yeah funny you should ask that Jay. We are making one next week and he just kind of looked at me like I was mad and he went well how much do you need? If you've got a spare five grand, that would do quite nicely. Next thing, there's £5,000, a cheque is being written. It just ha made all the difference with all the little extras that we had on set. Because up until that point, as much as we were blagging stuff and getting people to help us out and mates rates and all the rest of it, it just wasn't enough. We didn't have enough money at that point to be able to, to feed people, to water people, to to really just look after people on set. And as much as we, we do get great deals and we do ask for favours a lot of the time, we always try and look after people. And we were pulling our hair out because we just couldn't. And then Jason comes along wanting to dabble in the film industry and it was just perfect timing, it was brilliant. It really helped us to kind of get that budget up to a place where we needed to be to make sure that everybody on set was treated right. I'm Dan Morgan, I play the part of Dan Turner. Um, I think Phil, the director, has done that because of the time frame. He's actually just made it easier for himself by calling as many people their own name as possible. Uh, my name's Alvin, and I'm playing Alvin. I'm Colin, and I'm playing Colin. <laughs> Dan Turner is a, a news reporter who comes to try and get another big story about the guy who's selling himself online. Our characters are media chasers. Uh, we just go and see like big events and uh, camp out, see what's going down, things like that. And bring scotch eggs. Yeah, scotch eggs. They bring everything with them, like literally everything with <laughs> a kitchen sink, <laughs> essentially, is what they bring. And yeah, they're just two guys who... With a fantastic wardrobe. Yeah, <laughs> who live together, probably share each other's clothes. Brothers as well. Probably brothers, brothers. somehow. Uh, not, yeah. not in the sense of, he's my brother, safe, yo, <laughs> but <laughs> biological. Tell the reports. Oh my God. I'm seeing inside for the first time. I don't even know how to get in. In terms of research, watching the news, basically, uh, just in terms of their style of presentation, um, the way they kind of have to uh, sex it up in the way it's almost about them, the newsreader, being the star, um, as opposed to what the actual story is. And you watch some of these news channels and they're kind of, they're kind of like a Jerry Bruckheimer trailer for the news. You know, they're, they're all about the news anchor that's going to be on tonight and this you know, incisive, revealing documentary they've got on later. And then they'll have a little bit of news or a little bit of weather and that's back to all these trailers. Um, so hopefully that's something I'm going to be, I'm going to be bringing to the part of, of Dan Turner. You heard it here first yeah. on World News Channel. There's a pattern of it now. Yeah. You know, there's a pattern that's, that's been created and it, it allows you as the actor to sort of, just geographically, it allows you to, it all starts to make some more sense. Mm. 
normally on a on a feature film or any project like this it would take weeks to get set up you'd have your plan in place you'd know exactly which crew you needed what they would be doing when they would be arriving what they would be paid everything on this I can honestly say the day before we started filming at six o'clock Ben and I sat there thinking well we still need two soundies we still need an OB van we still need could do with another camera and we went through the list realizing we still hadn't got all of the people that we needed so of course in true producer style we went off to a quiet corner got on the phones and we did not stop ringing for two hours 20 past it's mad uh, in 24 hours from now we will be done like shooting half a movie yeah do you mind, but Winnie Vago's not ready. I've not put my slap on yet. Oh, I'm alright, mate, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm good. I've just, uh, Comfortous. there's so many cars, so many people. I'm just trying to get them all on the drive. Well, get me on the drive anyway. We arrived about 5.30 on set on Friday morning, um, thinking everything was in place to go, but not knowing. Um, when you're not paying people full rates or people are doing things as favours, people will very often have a nasty habit of forgetting or not turning up or, or that kind of thing. So there's always the worry in the back of your mind that somebody vital is not going to turn up and everything's going to have to stop. But as we drove onto the, the location street and saw a Winnebago, a dining bus, catering vehicle already serving people food some of whom weren't actually anything to do with the film shoot and makeup started happening and everything that you'd expect to start happening just started working um and i think that was the the re relief that it actually was happening as we planned it i walked onto the set and as i was walking down the road every step i was taking my chest was getting bigger and bigger and bigger as i was filling with pride and I mean, I've worked on a feature film as an actor. I knew what to expect in terms of scale and the amount of people there. Um, but I'd not worked on a multi-camera shoot on that scale before. So suddenly there were so many more people. And because we had our own cameramen in the film as well, our own sound crew in the film as well, it was just equipment everywhere and it was just buzzing and exciting. And then Jenny was stood there and Jenny just talked into her walkie-talkie and said, right, her on set. And that felt wonderful. Knobs, winks and gun. Show us. Shoulder shrugs and shoulder. Shoulder. That's why I haven't got any lines. Day one was a difficult day in some ways. You just had some of those guys, as much as the actors had to carry on pushing that performance all day, the sound guys had their sound kit with them all the time. They were pushed into the corners. They really did have uh, have a fight on their hands to get the boom uh, mic over the head of the operators who were handling fairly, I mean, industry standard 20 kilogram cameras. So what's that? A bag of sugars, two kilogram, 10 bags of sugar on your shoulder most of the day till lunchtime. Uh, I remember saying saying to one of them at one point when he went to put the camera down, whoa, whoa, whoa no, 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 put it back, put it back. You know. We're there. We're ready to shoot again. And, oh, you know, settling in a little bit sore. Put pads on the shoulders just to keep themselves going. Keep smiling. Keep smiling. Yeah. 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 Phil and I did talk, and we did say that we didn't want to rehearse. The the characters sort of rehearsed roughly, you know, in a way. They didn't get rehearsals rehearsals, the, but, but nor did, so we didn't want the operators to. We wanted to feel that they were discovering it for the first time. So if someone got up out of frame, they found it quite hard to follow them. Oh, you know, and, and you, you, traditionally in a, in a drama, you would say, oh, they break through the frame, we do another one. But you get used to that. You, your, your mind, your mind learns the rules in the first five minutes of a film, you will say, yeah, that's how this film works. You know, that one's handheld, that one's shot beautifully with long rolling tracks. This one is uh, almost shot in the dark. You get used to that idea. You, get, you know, your brain says, all right, you know, I'll accept those mistakes, I'll accept those things. If they're not too big, if they're stylistic, and we want to preserve that throughout, 
and we sort of figured as well that the operators would get better as, <laughs> as they went on. You'd we'll be able to just probably at the end edit a montage of, the, of different gurns that I do. So, very subtle difference, but there's, to the layman, there's probably not that much in it between me gurning for something that I've got wrong and for something that went right. But yeah, a bit of a, a, bit of a trial in terms of uh, stamina for those guys. I don't think they were used to shooting that style that long that intensely first position then we needed to treat this like like theater in a way um in terms of we set the stage for the actors to do their jobs and usually you know you'll shoot on a conventional film you may not even shoot a whole scene in one go you may shoot eight lines in a film and have to move the camera you know but in this um in, in this film, I had to sort of approach it a different way. Uh, and because the film was in real time, I thought, well, why not? Why don't we block it in real time as well? So instead of saying, okay, we're gonna do scene one and three uh, in this film, uh, in, uh, you know, in this bit of the shoot, uh, it was, we're gonna do 15 minutes of the film. Um, and whatever happens, happens. And the actors, that we selected uh, for this knew that if if shit hit the fan, you know, um, during a take, they had to carry on. And and I was quite mean with them when I talk, spoke to them about that. I said, if anyone like giggles, you know, because it, it happens, it happens. But if anyone loses it, loses concentration during a take, and I have to cut, I'm going to be very upset. And that's kind of. Really the only harsh kind of word I said, or remember saying really, I said, I'm gonna be very upset if anyone wants to start again. Even if you fumble a line, you know, uh, carry on. Or take a tiny pause if you can and say the line again. Because if I cut that camera, it's gonna cost me 20 minutes. Because people put the camera down, steady cam guy needs a break, you know, someone, oh, makeup comes in, you know, and it's not a simple reset because you're probably in another room. So you have to move everything back in and start over and over again. And I've wasted, well, 20 minutes of the film. Because if you think about it, it doing it in real time, is that, well, that's 20 minutes of my film, you know? The film's 88 minutes, I think, 87 minutes. Um, that's a lot, that's a lot of the film. Um, so I think it took a while for the actors, well, I think it took a while for everyone to get their heads around it. Because not many people had a lot of rehearsal. And I remember speaking to um, certain people about this idea um, and uh, it, I, it was approaching this as reality, as theatre, as almost like a live event, you know, and we were capturing it in blocks, in, in blocks. Um, and people's cues would be on minutes, because we knew the film started at 10 past 10 in the morning. That's when the film time starts. So I knew, you know, people needed to know where they were by, you know, at what, okay, where are you at 11 o'clock? You know, uh, and that's kind of how they did it. It's quite hard to get your head around, but actually when you break down the script, everything is to time, you know. This film is to time. I mean, we know it starts at this point. We know that uh, the bid ends at this point, at this time, and then it's broken down into like 20 minute blocks of action in between, you know, up until then. And like in reality, people's cues were taking on events changing. Now, it had its strengths and weaknesses because um, it, 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 it's, it's quite a complex idea, but it, it worked in terms of what time is it now and what's going on. But then, Obviously, because we're editing the film, it isn't a live event. When you get into edit and you've got people saying, oh yeah, there's 15 minutes left from the bid. When you look at that timeline in post, it has to be 15, 15 minutes or whatever it left in the film. It has to exist. And my hat really goes off to um, Jess Blake and Dan Morgan uh, and the news crews who were out there um, because they were improvising their socks off because of time. When you look at the you know, end of the film, it's like the last six minutes of the bid. 
That is six minutes. It's not Hollywood six minutes, you know, where like you, a bomb's going off in 30 seconds and it's eight minutes later, it's still not gone off. That is six minutes exactly. Now, six minutes is a long time to actually improvise. And actually, they're not even, they were doing like, in like a 20 minute block. And they, so it was important to have these timelines that say what is going on inside the house at all times and what is going on outside the house at all times. So not about when you're seen, you need to know what you're doing when the camera or the script isn't on you. Because actually, I've used both. And that's where the, that's kind of where the improvisation in the script, you know, went hand in hand. Where, you know, the scripted important, you know, uh, stuff that was furthering the story was, had these gems of improvisation that were going on at the same time. And you can see, um, how that well that works in one of the opening scenes when you know Lee Bomb is at the window, you know, because Maya's outside doing her spiel to camera and uh, piece to camera, and the boys inside are running the scene that they did the day before, and he gets to the window and it's all in time, yeah, and it and it works. My name is Lee Boardman. Um, I play Chris. Chris is. Um, a dysfunctional oddball, really. He's socially illiterate. I think there's a weird kind of mutual dependency between himself and John because they've both suffered similar fates in their life. They're not similar people, but uh, they've suffered similar things like losing jobs and, and uh, John tolerates Chris uh, because Chris is um, an ear for John and a sounding board and uh, I think Chris just can't believe that somebody like John would let him into his lovely home. Chris lends himself to just sort of be standing in the background and drawing attention to himself because it's just so, you know, comedically vacant, his whole persona. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to, we're going to do a, a one hour, 30 minute movie in, uh, we're going to rehearse it, well I'm going to rehearse it in a day, and then we're going to shoot it over two days. I mean it's, Phil is, is almost insane sort of dreaming it up but it's it's tinged with genius the idea because um, the way that he's broken it down very carefully it's a, it can be done I couldn't resist being involved in it because it was such a unique idea you know fingers crossed it'll work <laughs> famous last words the second day of filming was the biggest challenge I think of the whole project obviously at the end of the first day everyone was extremely tired and a couple of beers, straight to bed, not really a lot of time to think about it, and we roll up on day two, and kapow. The second day was all about the exteriors, so for that we needed 100 extras, we needed all the vehicles, we needed the Bentley, we needed all the key props that were the hardest things to actually organise. There's no other script that we've seen that you could actually sensibly do that. From a, a logistics point of view, that made life so much easier for us because it was very clearly defined interior, exterior. It was then down to Phil and to Aidan to then work out what that meant in terms of scenes, who shot what, in what order. We didn't need to, at that point, worry too much about that. We just needed to make sure that everybody was geared up for interiors or exteriors. So it took an awful lot of pressure off. Um, in the beginning because it was very clearly defined. So from a logistical point of view, dead easy. Anyone who's had anything to do inside the house, you called on Friday. Anyone who's got anything to do with outside the house, your call is Saturday. So day two, technical challenges. Well, try and not shoot each other with seven cameras. Yeah, two cameras, fine. You know, you can see the news cameras, that's fine. But if you look closely, and it's that sort of thing about there being media there anyway. You get away with a certain amount of, there's going to be other news cameras there, not just the two that are in the garden running around. So if you look at the finished footage, I was really subtle about it. I thought that, in fact, I didn't think about it at all. I was wearing this green zip-up jumper. So <laughs> I must be like the easiest person in the world to spot in the crowd, you know. Lime green, fluorescent, zip-up jumper. Yeah, nice one, Mike. And I think my, my gaffer, stroke focus puller, stroke operator, stroke T-boy, was wearing you know, like red. So it must have looked like either some odd form of 3D or 
the court jester, one or the other. You're great in taking this job on now, Eddie. Hey? You're great in taking this job on. I'm loving it. It's good, good crack. Move on. Actors are scared. I know, but they're great. I'm scared. They're great. Though. Everyone's scared apart from the director. <laughs> I am not allowed to be scared. This is why I go and smoke and then I can go around the van. If you want to to me you're doing funny stuff in a camera, it's not a problem because I'm stupid. Let's have everyone back for rehearsal, please. And we, en we ended up with getting an awful lot of stuff. There's an awful lot goes into film production and 15 thousand pounds as it was then and then 20,000 in the end we ended up with uh, uh, five uh, red one cameras two ENG news cameras uh, we had a little handy cam camera that shops a couple of the scenes on that and some behind the scenes footage as well we had a Z1 camera about 100 extras over the over the course of the day um, that was kind of interesting when you're not paying people getting them to stay for an entire day so some people kind of drifted in and drifted out but actually it worked brilliantly with the plot two outside broadcast vehicles even though we only needed one, we changed the script because two turned up on the day. Well, the second one wasn't quite, wasn't quite the OB truck that the first one was. And here's, here's a little te technical thing for you, if you want like them. Um, in the first OB truck that was actually an OB truck, we had to green screen all of the TV screens so we could replace them, put footage on them, put different uh, elements, different graphics on them. And... The second OB truck, which was Dan Turner's truck, Dan Turner, gentlemen, uh, was just some van that we managed to rest from somewhere, and anything that was done inside of there, and I can't remember whether it appeared in the final. I have to have another look at the, at the movie to see whether we actually saw into that truck. I'm not sure we did, but we decided we were going to double the inside of Dan Turner's truck using the other proper OB truck. We had a burger van, a working burger van mm -hmm. as well, that made a fortune on the day, selling to the crowd. We had our catering vehicle, which was very kindly donated to us at the last minute. We had a dialing bus, a toilet block, rubbish removal people coming to remove rubbish. We just yeah. had so many people chipped in at the last minute. Day two was, was a little bit more freeform. Um, everyone, was, every, everyone was doing everything. Um, at one point, the uh, gaffer... Joe was operating and I was pulling focus for him and then, you know, if he'd looked away and looked back, I'd have the camera on my shoulder and he'd be put focus pulling for me and um, producers operating. Ever, everyone was just doing everything and getting involved. It, it's, it's odd because I think 60% of people come into the film business to become filmmakers and out of those, 95% of those people find their way into doing other things. And occasionally, you actually get to become a filmmaker again. And that means you're allowed to get involved in other things. He's great. I love, I so love directing cute. kids. I'm about to star in a feature film. I speak to James. Yeah. Um, Hello, James. Everyone say hi, James. Hello, James. Hello, James. Hello, James. Good morning. Hi, James. This is Wardrobe, and this is Jerry and Rachel. No filming while I'm changing. Perhaps do things quickly because time's money. Hiya. What's your name, please? My name is Christopher Dane. What's your name, please? My name is Ollie, and I'm useful. What's your name, please? My name is Lee Boardman, and I am an actor. Is it fun? <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's a comedy, but you know it's one of those comedies where there's a bit of serious stuff going on as well. What does an AD person do? Basically, AD stands for Assistant Director. So we make sure that the director who's shooting the film is happy, and we get everything sorted for him, and to keep the schedule of our shoot going and ticking over. That's what we do. Got to shoot, guys, please. Can you tell me a bit about your character? I can. He is incredibly handsome. <laughs> it's you. Yes, it is me. Well spotted. Um, he's got a very good suntan. Um, he is a bit of a bumbling weirdo. idiot, really. A weirdo. Is, yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank An you. absolute pleasure. No, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, but just to torture myself even further, you know, yes, film with two, fil shoot a film in two days, I decided to do some one-shot sequences in this film, which you think, logically, you think, oh, well, do stuff in one shot, 
yeah, well, obviously that's real time, you know, and it's one camera and, you know, that's great. But they take a hell of a lot of choreography, especially when you've got a Steadicam guy in a four minute long dialogue scene between two people moving through a crowd of extras and, uh, you know, uh, the sheer choreography it takes a long time, you know, and usually um, on, on a normal filming day, you might spend all day doing that. You know, you, you, you really might. That's about how long it takes. We didn't have all day, obviously. We had the amount of time to do it twice. And my, you know, hat goes off to Joe, the Sadicom operator, because he just went with it. He just felt the action. And that's why, you know, we had those operators, because we worked with them before. They were the best of the best of the best. And they just went with it. And they weren't afraid to make choices. And that, that was important as well, is to make sure everyone had ownership of this thing. Everyone was responsible for what they were doing and to make those choices that were right for the story. And everyone was on, you know, on, the, on the same page of that. So, yeah, I did these two one-shot sequences in the opening and, uh, you know, in a dialogue scene halfway through the film, which is actually one of my favourite scenes of the whole film uh, between Jess and Dan. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a pleasure to do. And I just love one-shot sequences. The... Adrenaline that was running for the second day, it was just fantastic because you had, it was, I suppose it was something of a live event for us. We're not used to shooting drama like a live event. With a live event, you might get the cameras in shot and you might accept that. But with drama, you can't really do that. But we had Joe Bull and the Steadicam op was on rehydration rehydration drinks in order to keep himself uh, alive. He was sweating and he, he'd say to me after every half an hour, can I just put this down for a minute? I said, All right, put the rig down for 30 seconds, but don't take anything off because you don't have time. We, um, we broke him. I think he said to me, I think his quote at the end of the day was, that is the hardest and most enjoyable day I've ever spent working. I'm glad he put that bit on the end, working. He did a fantastic job, and the the other the other camera operators, um, Berent and Paul, knew exactly where we wanted to be. Steadicam takes them into a shot, and they'd be walking in beside the Steadicam at the end to pick up the two shot. No such thing as let's break it there and go again. They'd grab their opportunities for the shot as they went, and I'd be running after the Steadicam maybe tweaking exposure, seeing what that was like, going around to one of the cameras, checking that in case, you know, maybe the light would change by a stop and then running around to the other one, tweaking that. Ideally, we would have had communications and, you know, gantries and OB trucks and all that sort of stuff, but it wasn't that sort of gig. It was, this is essentially low budget filmmaking. Um, so I'd be able to run around to someone and say, oh, you know, your, your shot's getting a bit identical to the steady cam shot, just push yourself in there and be able to give them an edge of frame and say, look, you know, stand up to that wire and you'd be able to get that shot, it'd be much better. Or... And the nice thing was, I mean, traditionally, I don't have anything to do with sound, but I'm wearing headphones to see what the actors are doing, see what's going on, uh, making little tweaks as we go and hoping that it makes sense by the end of the day, that every little thing you do doesn't spoil something that's already been set up and having that judgment to know when to make a tweak and know when to say okay right either we've missed that one that one doesn't matter or it's too late or I'll do that on another shot because I know we can do that on another shot. I think with modern technology like that because we're using reds we're using digital you know we don't have that processing time we can literally look at it on your computer the second you've shot it. The thing that I've sort of forgotten is the fact that there was a little DIT, a little data wrangler in the back of there somewhere, wrangling terabytes and terabytes of footage. Just poof, 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 another drive, another drive, another drive, another drive. Second day, five cameras, drives coming in from all over the place. And it all went exceedingly smoothly. Um, well, basically, we're the Wings team from Manchester. So we had a special request off of um, Mercedes. Obviously, we gave her a wing, and she said that you guys would really need some energy. And, like, could we come down and give you guys some wings? Let's get some of the feature film, shall we? And Chris Webb, I'm the locations manager, is just uh, appeasing the neighbours. Firefighting is the best way to describe it. Uh, 
making sure that everybody's, you know, not parking across anybody else's drive, upsetting anybody or running cables where they shouldn't be or treading on somebody's pristine lawn or, uh, you know, this sort of carry-on. I'm also the caterer. We cater for the whole event, you know, breakfast, lunch, afternoon tea, labouring to the every demand of a very demanding crew. Um, and and that's, that's very challenging. And, yeah, we're on with it. It's all going well. He says, touching, trying to find some wood to touch somewhere. <laughs> some scenes happened in one take, literally one take. Um, the ad-libbing was so good that Phil was happy with it. We didn't want to go again. Um, and it wisely um, moved things along so that if we needed to do second takes in the afternoon, we had time to do those. That meant that um, poor old Eddie, first AD, his schedule just got thrown out, scrumpled up and thrown out the window. It, uh, it bore no resemblance to what he'd written the night before by about 9.30 the next morning. We were due to film with the car, the family car that... And it was a key scene in the film. I've crashed cars on film sets. And the way it had been scheduled, we were due to film that after lunch. So my responsibility to organise the family car, it was booked for after lunch. Of course, things changed in the morning and all of a sudden at eight o'clock, I could hear on talk back, Sadie's, can we, we're ready for the family car now. Sadie's, the family car. And I'm thinking, what family car? It's coming in the afternoon. Next thing from Phil on talk back. Um, Mercedes, yeah, we're ready for the family car. Everyone's, everyone's waiting. One of the worst things that happened on um, the outside day, day two, was that a house alarm went off. Now, usually you go, all oh, right, okay, fine. Fag break, coffee break, you know, everyone will, will sort out what it is. Okay, no problem. Oh my God, we haven't got a family car. So I ran, I literally legged it down to find Paul from the art department. I went, Paul, what car have you got? He went, well, that blue one there. I said, brilliant, park it on the drive for me. But that alarm went off what felt like days. And the longer that alarm went off, the less time I could shoot dialogue. So off he goes, he drives the car on the van. Next thing I hear on talk back, there appears to be a blue car driving on the drive. Yes, Phil, that's your family car. Well, I thought we were having a silver. Yes, it's changed. You've got a blue one now. And it's really simple. And it was basically some people away and they weren't in the house. And we had to like track down a neighbor who could get into the house and you know, every second counted. Yeah, so having, having got the car, we then realized of course it was a manual and- I only drive automatic. Generally drives an automatic. Four o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call on Talkback. Sadie's, you're urgently required at the Winnebago. So I'm thinking, oh, how nice, someone's made me a cuppa. Sadly not, no, there were two coppers stood there questioning why we'd taken over the street. So the first thing that she did with this very dramatic scene when she got in the car to, to drive it away um, is she stalled it on the drive. And it turned out that somebody locally had had a problem driving their car through the street. They weren't happy, police had been called. So of course my natural reaction is, come on boys, let's come with me, let's have a cup of bar of chocolate, sandwich anybody. And eventually we actually had a, a, a stunt driver um, drive it away for her. Oh God, the police are going to shut the shoot down. But of course, through your mind, you're thinking, well, no, we've cleared everything. We've informed everybody that we need to inform. Yes, we've done everything that we needed to do. And actually, they just wanted to come and have a bit of a nosy just to make sure that everything was all tickety-boo, which it was, thank goodness. Just to take that kind of pressure off her. She, she had enough, enough to think about with the acting. She didn't need to be a stunt driver as well at the same time. When he says stunt driver, what he actually means is one of the assistants from the set actually jumped in the car and drove it. It sounded better as stunt driver. <laughs> but you could, just, you could just start it and then... My name is Leslie Joseph. I'm an actress. And I got involved with this two days ago. Uh, I played John Foster's mother, who uh, actually only cares about herself, doesn't really care about John Foster and actually only comes to be on the telly and to meet Dan Turner, who's her favourite TV presenter. She just wants to meet Dan Turner and get a face on the box, and her husband hasn't even bothered to come. Where's Dan? Oh, he's at home watching it on the telly. He didn't come because he didn't want to miss anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a wrap now. Thank you. So there we are. That's, I'm wrapped now for the evening. It was a great I'm fun. Just coming through. Through. It was literally... I'm being you now, going... Are you being me? I know, it was come on board, um, rehearsed.
rehearse and record all in one minute, not knowing what's coming out of anybody's mouth, but the most fun I've had in Stockport, in Cheadle, on a Saturday in August, or even September, and this man's a genius. And it's all being put together in two days, and it's going to be huge, because it's great, very funny, and I've loved every minute. I think about it now, having done it, and think it's, an, it's, a, it's a stupid thing to do. You know, who makes a film in two days? I mean, it's 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 a crazy amount of time. We did a feature film in two days. Really? Yeah, we did it. We did that. We, did that. we all did it. It could shake us immeasurably. And with all things considered, that's well understood. There's a shock here among us to watch some. There are so many independent films made these days. So many films. There's so many films that don't see the light of day just because that's the industry that's that's the world we live in you know there's a traditional distribution model you know you need uh, your sales agent you need distributor you need to do it this way that way that way and if you don't have stars you don't have anything that's marketable or anything like that you, you never you know it's never going to be seen you know by the masses anyway and I didn't want this to be a film that did that Very tired. Getting relieved got your day like, but I can't really explain how I feel. It's very emotional. I've done it. It's, it's a feat. It's a feat of endurance and a feat of, of, of vision. And um, somebody should call Norris McWhirt or the Guinness Book of Records because I don't think it features the remaining two days, man. A feature of this scale has not been made. The size, it's a much bigger scale feature than it the budget would suggest and uh, it's just been a lot of friggin hard work by everybody and dedication and it's it's come on I can't believe it I can't believe it I can't believe I'm going on now <laughs> and that we're going to be screaming them on it's just insane <laughs> so that is me Boardman Fiend. yes it is a bit of a gimmick to do it in two days but I would never ever ever sacrifice the story and the characters for a gimmick you know, you, that, that's just, you're in trouble already if that's the way you're thinking. Audiences don't see that. They see people and they see story. Well, it's quarter past eight on day two of filming. And I don't know about you, but I am knackered. They're still recording some music outside with Liam Frost. They're just doing a sound check out there. Um, as you can see, the house is nowhere near back to being sorted yet. So we've still probably got about three or four hours work to go. Well, we made a film. Yay! <laughs> well, the sun sets quick as our eyes first meet, and we take the wrong turn down the vision street.